my God, I feel like I'm at a Maroon 5 concert. This is great. So it's great. we are going to start today with a little bit of introductions. So why don't we start with you, Ma? Okay. Um, Pa, how did you come to co-found Pa with Pajman? And just give us a one-minute intro on that story. Okay, it's a good story, so I'm glad you asked. Um, we started Pear in 2013. I actually had moved uh, to the US from Spain in 1995. I went to school there. I started three companies. I had done one angel investment at the time by 2013. And my partner, Pashman, had come from Iran. He had been in no companies, but he had done a lot of angel investing for 15 years. He was actually an angel investor in one of my companies. And in 2009, he said, let's start, pay let's start a fund. I really want to help founders. And um, we're going to rent a house, and we're going to fill it up with Stanford students, and we're going to back the best of them. <laughs> and I want you to do it with me. And I said, oh my god, this man is insane. What year was this? This was 2009. 2009. Okay. I said, you're insane. I'm not renting a house with you. Um, and he tried for four years to convince me. Ultimately, uh, he decided to change strategy. And he said, oh, forget the house. Let's just go do some angel investing. Uh, we started meeting at Cooper Cafe, which is this cafe in Palo Alto. Um, at first, like an hour a week, then an hour a day, and then eight hours a day. And I said, fine, you win. Let's go build uh, a fund. So we raised the fund. We rented a home. And we still have a home where you know, it's like a communal space where founders work. There's no charge. There's a lot of food and activity. So it's, you know, anyway. So and Pejman got his And house. you've been to that place. I, I have. I had tea yes. with Pejman there. Yeah. Pepe, give me one minute intro on you. Yeah, my, my story, I'm also from Barcelona. I actually moved to the States in 2008. Just fascinated by Silicon Valley and its entrepreneurial culture. And I wanted to learn from others and eventually start my company. And, and so I did. Um, in 2011, we started Charvus. And that's a company that I've led for 10 years, backed by Sequoia Capital, and, and successfully sold to Zynga last year. And uh, so I took some time off after selling it. And I knew socially, actually, Mar, as a fellow Spaniard in Silicon Valley, and she seduced me together with the rest of the team to come <laughs> over to this side. Uh, so I joined as a venture partner uh, first, uh, uh, part time. And you know, three days a week that I committed for became seven days a week quickly. So I want today to be as like tactical and granular as possible, especially for founders. I think that's what Slush specializes in. And we're going to focus specifically on the fundraising market. It's changing every day. And I want to start at seed first. And so when we look at the seed market today, are valuations fundamentally different now versus 2021? Yes, yeah, so yes, they're lower. Valuations are lower than 2021. But I, I want to put things on perspective because 2021 is not the benchmark. And if we back track uh, to the last 10 years, we saw one of our early investments, DoorDash, did a seed round at, a, at an 8 million valuation in 2013. Huh. Last year, we saw a company actually out of Colombia, founded by fellow Spaniards, doing a 14 million round at a north of 60 million valuation. So again, that is not the benchmark. And what we're seeing now is valuations going back to 15 to 20 million for seed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. We are expecting valuations to maybe drop a little bit, but not too much. And the reason is that there's so many investors. There's liquidity in this market. Um, yesterday, I think at the investor event, there were 1,700 investors. So there are opportunities for early stage uh, companies. So, so we think we're at reasonable, state, uh, reasonable levels um, now. I, I, we said we'd go off schedule, so we are. But I'm just too interested. You said that like, OK, 15 to 20. So that's like four or five on a 15, 20, 25 post, whatever we go for. Like, the thing I, I don't see anymore, really, is actually the friends and family or the pre-seed. It seems like for pedigreed founders, we've skipped this one on five stage, and we've just gone straight to the three or four on 15 to 20. Do, do you see what I see? or? Uh, definitely. I think there is, uh, if you are uh, what I call them elite founders, and yeah. everybody has a different definition of an elite founder. Could be a second time founder or somebody who's, you know, been at a high growth company for a long time. So you have an exec out of Klarna go and start a company. Um, they get just a premium on valuation. 
uh, and they skip that pre-seed round. But for most companies, there is this pre-seed round where you need that initial, you know, uh, cash to prove something. So, you know. I mean, speaking of needing cash, I think the really interesting thing is also like how much cash to raise and how much runway to raise for. I actually always take the view that you should always raise much more than you need because things always take longer. When you think about fundraising today and advising founders in the audience, how much runway is the right amount of fun run runway to raise for uh, specifically today, do you think? And how do you advise them? So for seed, we don't typically ask for necessarily for a runway of 18 months. I know we've heard this, yeah. this word quite a lot. But we do want our founders to be nimble, to be able to be very agile and iterate. Companies need iterations, right? So you need to have that enough space to iterate, to, f to get closer to product market fit, and to build sustainably for, for the long term. I think in our portfolio, 40% of our companies have gone through iterations and pivots, Hosting. right? One of our stars, Branch, for instance, uh, they've done three pivots. Uh, they started, uh, <laughs> they've gone from a consumer app to now being a, a deep link SDK, right? T totally agree. And you need, you need that time and, and that space to be able to iterate. I, and I would even go farther and say that the measure of success really, really early on, your KPI is how well are you iterating? So how many iterations can you fit in a cycle of pre-seed, right? And it has to be a good iteration, meaning that you can't quit too early, so you have to try it all the way, and you have to learn something from that iteration. So you have to be measuring, so you can do the next one with some more knowledge, right? So the random walk doesn't work. You have to be thoughtful as to how you do it. I do just want to dig in on that. Speaking of like measuring in each iteration, yes. can you give us an example of one, just so we can actually kind of go granular on and understand what that means, and so people can build that velocity into their iterations? What do you mean when you Maybe, maybe I can talk to you about Branch. This is an older company of ours, and you know, originally when we invested, so this is iteration two, um, they had a consumer app where you could choose photos and you get a photo album. And we said, okay, um, you know, I gave him some money initially, a pre-seed money, and I said, let's try grow, let's try paid advertising to see if it works, right? So the founders went out at Christmas when everybody prints photos and we, you know, tried to change the knobs to, to get to a reasonable CAC. We couldn't get there. I think we tried every possible. No, but we were tracking and we couldn't get there. And you know, the founder was ultimately convinced this is never going to work, right? And then he iterated. And the iteration said, well, if I want to print, I'm not just going to print from my app. I want to print from every possible app in the world. So I'll, be, I'll build a printing SDK. So I would call that a pivot, yeah. but it's somewhat of an informed pivot, right? In I that sense. Totally get you. Uh, again, I'm so sorry because we did have <laughs> the schedule. But when we think, I, I had a founder the other day and they had six on the table, but they only set out to raise three. Okay. And I said, listen, f raise. Yeah, okay, I, I, I love this question. <laughs> I'm interested to, uh, we might have different views on this. I was like, five or six, take it. Put aside three, like pretend like you have three, save it in the bank and operate with the mentality that you only raise three, but you need the cash. And actually, it's better to have that for the rainy day because iterations can always last longer. What do you think? Well, that, that is an approach. I think having been, on the <laughs> having been on the founder's side, it definitely gives you a safety net. It allows you to maybe think bigger, which yeah. is necessary, just having that cushion. Yeah. Um, I think I, I would... From the, 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 on the other side of the spectrum, there's uh, those founders who just want to raise as little as possible, whatever you need, and, and, and I, again, stay nimble. I, I have to say this, because when you say, put it away, and people don't act the same way. If you don't have money, you're going to work, you're going to go figure out the truth before you know, anybody else, right? When you have money, you hide the truth. Yeah. And if you look at numbers, raising a higher seed is not a sign of you making it to a Series A. It's not. It's I do not. Think it gives you amazing leverage for fundraisers as well. I think it gives you more time. I, 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 I tell you that the DNA of a suffering company is irreplaceable. Yeah. It's irreplaceable. And, and by the way, if you, if you are a founder, and I want to look at you, you only have so much equity in a company, right? It's a bad sign when a founder is like, I want to raise more money to be sure. It's like, okay, you don't believe you can do it. 
right? I'm just saying you, you should keep all the equity for yourself, uh, not for me or anybody else. Right. We, we've seen that. Execution is so important. And in terms of scarcity, we're way more productive. Yeah. Just think of you getting ready for an exam. When do you study more? <laughs> So the when day I when you're I getting ready for an exam, when do you study more? The day before or a month before? I think that's on the assumption that I did study for the exams. <laughs> yes. um, but, uh, I, I, I see it all, all the time, the curve of productivity of a company. The less they have, the more they do. I think the really interesting thing, though, like taking this company for an example, like, you know, there was a lot of interest in this company, but then for a lot of other companies, there's not interest. And a lot of times, it's because of the space that they're in. And investor kind of attraction is often led by segments. Like when you think about segments enjoying investor tailwinds and segments that are maybe colder, how do you think about which are kind of colder and hotter? And how do you advise founders in, in well, both I could Well, you know, I can tell you today, in this environment, anything that needs a lot of money, it's a hard sector to invest in, right? Because money is more expensive. So, you know, you couldn't do something like a last mile delivery company. I mean, I think you've seen all the last mile people, um, I think, you know, cutting costs, right? Like, I think Gorillas, Pepe was telling me they were burning $90 million a month. So you got to cut, you got to cut. Um, autonomous vehicles, they need a lot of cash, right? So, I mean, you, we've seen Argo, AI, um, just shut down. They've raised $3.6 billion, right? There's not enough cash to build that. There are some bright spots. If anybody in the audience is doing generative AI, there is a premium going on for those companies. <laughs> you know, Pepe and I were actually using generative AI to answer your questions. Oh, really? No, just kidding. Oh, great. I'm, I'm thrilled. <laughs> um, hope not it's real. good. I hope it's good. <laughs> I want to ask, I think a lot of founders have raised a seed or raised yeah. some money, and they're thinking, OK, well, funding markets have changed. How have expectations of where my business is changed as well? When you think about what companies need to do in graduating from seed to A, what has changed in the last year? Um, what we've seen, good companies always raise, and I don't think that's changed. Yeah. I think, I think um, uh, the best companies, and by, by good companies, what we mean at Pair, and, and we're like building towards four things. First, you need economics. They need to be profitable uh, and get as close as possible to co contribution margin profitable. We like uh, businesses that have higher LTV than CAC and ideally 3x at least LTV from CAC. We like low payback times. And then we want growth, growth, and being able to fuel that growth, right? That is the goal. Obviously, at C, you're, <laughs> you're not like getting there. sounds like a great there. company. Right. Exactly. Um, so I think I. You got it? Hello, hello. You did. There we go. Am hey. I back? Yes. All right. So anyways, I don't think the, these uh, basic fundamentals have changed. But obviously, when money is expensive, and we're clearly in that period of time, the bar is, is just higher. So anyone building a company right now, focus on being as much as possible to show signs of building a good company. I, I think, you know, at Seed, you're trying to figure out, can I build a machine that can scale and grow? And when you get Series A money, it's all about scaling that machine, right? So a good Series A investor is looking at not necessarily the you know, the, how much revenue or the, any absolute value they're looking at can you scale? So it's more about um, you know, the expectation than the actual level. But you know, to give you some numbers, which maybe the audience is interested in, think in 2021, a Series A, you didn't need much revenue. I would say a few hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Uh, you would get, nobody cared about metrics in terms of LTV to CAC or payback. It's like, you're going to figure it out. Don't worry about it. Uh, the multiples were 100 to 300x. So, you know, you could be a company that was doing, I don't know, 300K in ARR, and you would be 100 million. You could even be zero revenue on a hundred million valuation, right? Clubhouse. Well, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Often it's easier to raise money like pre-launch or on zero Absolutely. revenue. Absolutely. That was yeah. a, a, a Series A in 2021 was a seed 
you know, today. Now in 2022, so this is today, if you go and raise a Series A, what happens with everything is the pendulum swings, right? So if this was 2017, we went this way and now we're this way. So people are much more demanding, right? So you're going to need enough revenue. Um, and I, I want to say that you know, there's no absolute, but people want you to do, I'm seeing people actually want one and a half to two million, especially if you've raised a big seed, right? If you've raised six million, if you spent it, then they want more revenue. They're going to want those unit economics that Pepe said, et cetera. So you might be a company doing one and a half or two million ARR, and your 2022 valuation may be 50. And you're like, you have valuation nostalgia from you know, a year ago. So you have to let go because the rules have changed. And, um, you know, one of the things founders should not do is trade crappy terms for high valuations at the end of the day. Can, can we play out like a hypothetical scenario? Let's there, do it. There's a startup and they've got 12 <laughs> months of runway, okay? So they don't need to raise now, but leverage is always great. But they're also thinking, ah, oh, I don't know, 2023 could be even worse. How do you advise founders in the... 10 to 12 months of runway where we don't know what 23 is going to look like. Some say it's worse, some say it's much worse. How do you advise them on when to raise and how to time their fundraise? I mean, it, it takes time to raise, right? And we're seeing now at least six months ahead, I would say. Um, so again, it depends on where you are on that iteration process and th those sign of becoming a good company. Yeah. So I would say uh, raise at least <laughs> start raising at least nine months ahead because you're 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 gonna need good six months. I don't know, Mar, what do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I would look at a company and say, okay. Let's look at all those questions, those four things that Pepe was saying, and let's see what grade do we give ourselves. Do we have proven unit economics? Do we have uh, growth? Do we have retention? Do we have payback times that are under control? Whatever it is, it's slightly different if you're a consumer or a B2B company. If the metrics are good, then I'm not, I'm not worried, okay? Because I know we will be able to raise. If the metrics are not good, depending on how far we are, uh, today, you know, if you're assuming you're really far, I'm going to say 10 months is not enough. We need a longer time. Because it takes time for a company to figure things out, right? If you're close, I may say, okay, let's, you know, do minor iterations. We'll probably be able to get there. So it really is on a case-by-case -case basis, right? And depends on really the fundamentals of that engine. Are they working or are they not working? Can I ask, what happens to all the companies that raise preemptive Series A's yes. with very little revenue, very little product market fit, but in a popular space? What happens to all of them in this new market? They're at a higher risk, right? Because let's assume you were that $100 million company yeah. um, at zero revenue. So now you're you are literally at the iteration stage where you're trying to figure out your go-to-market and your product. You're at the same risk level as a seed company. It might take one iteration, two, ten, or infinite iterations, which means you never get there, right? Um, you may go out on fundraise with a $2 million in revenue, and then your valuation is only 60. And then it's a trouble, because what do you do? You're going to do a down round. Down round are horrible for founders. They're just terrible, because you get completely diluted and so on. So those companies have to work really, really hard to grow into that $100 million valuation. Can I just jump on that? Yes. Albert Wenger from USV tweeted recently that like, in his career, you know, there's a lot of talk about down rounds, but in his career, he's only ever seen or executed on two. Um, and actually, they're not as common as people think. And it's so challenging with the damage to morale and what happens to internals within the company. Like, have you had a down round uh, you know, process go through and what advice would you give to founders who are contemplating going through it or going through it? Well, you know, there are many ways to do down rounds, right? And I think when a company, I mean, when we invest, and I think a lot of venture people feel this way, we are part of that team. If the founder, I mean, listen, the founders got raised money at 100 million, let's say this hypothetical company, um, 
somebody paid that. Yeah. They're responsible as well, right? We're both responsible for those prices. So if we need to do a down round, and, and you want to keep the company successful, you need to take care of your team, of the team, because ultimately those are the people that do the work, right? So if you do a down round in a way where the founders and the team are still significant owners of that company, so you take some of the blame, um, you're okay. If you take a down round where you are like, I don't care, my legal documents say this, I'm going to do whatever it takes, um, then there's a lower chance of ultimate success, right? So yeah. it really depends on how you do it. You can't be that greedy. This is not just the founder's fault. This is everybody's fault. Yeah. One, one point that I would like to make, because we're taking the f fundraising perspective here, sure. but one thing that we tend to forget is also our responsibility as founders to, to build teams. And I think today, the talent is extremely informed. So those companies that last year did these crazy rounds with very little uh, revenue, as you said, talent knows that. And I've been, I've been in good times and hard times, and it's very hard to get the best talent as a founder when people know that your valuation was inflated, that revenue is not there. So I think because we're talking about finding fantastic unicorns, I think we also need to think about the impact of having these crazy rounds, not only from a financing perspective, but also on building teams that are going to help help you succeed in the future. So do you, do you kind of just say how it is then? If you're one of the founders of one of these very inflated like, price companies, do you say to the team, hey, we're all aware that this price is something that we're going to have to grow into, but let's grow into it. To get, how do you communicate that to the team when they're going, this is crazy? I think as my perspective, again, having been in hard times is transparently and vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, uh, you need to be open to the reality and what the company is. And my experience has always been that even if you don't know how to get out of this, but if you communicate it as soon as possible early on to everyone, especially the top talent in the company, um, they're going to feel involved and they're going to be part of the solution. I mean, a lot of people are repricing options, right? Yeah. So that's an important part. To Absolutely. keep your employees, you have to reprice those options. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to ask a really unfair one now. We have product, we have market, and we have team. How do we weigh these three kind of core pillars of a company when making an investment decision today? You should take it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it depends on where you are. From my seed, where we do seed, um, and seed means typically there's nothing. There's no product, there's no customers, or there may be some MVP, but it's very, very early. It's all team. I mean, our majority is team. It's all we have, right? Um, but there's a caveat on that team. I mean, we're looking as to how they present the company. And the, the company at Seed is just an initial hypothesis of some product you're building and a market you're going to. So I look at how the founder is describing that market, how ambitious they are, uh, how knowledgeable they are about the product of what they're going after. So all those details matter. Right? It's not just the founder, it's kind of their awareness of the rest as well, right? But yeah, I think Mike Maple says it very well. He says, like, what's your insight development? Yeah. Like, how do you see the world in a way that they don't see it yet? Oh, exactly. That's part of it, right? And some founders have spent 10 years working on something, so they bring something to the table, for sure. We've mentioned iterations many times. We've mentioned pivots many times. I think the hardest thing when you're going through it is, When's too early? When's too late? And what's the right time? You've both been through pivots. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's never too early or too late. We uh, we try to work together with our companies very early on to put together operating plans. Yeah. When you have milestones, goals that you live and breathe for, and you look at the hard data, it's not. It, it, you, you don't get emotional about pivots, right? So I think the sooner you put together a plan, you set up goals um, across the organization. It's not only product adoption, it can be team, it can be, um, but with clear metrics, it's, you, you're going to easily see that things are not working out, right? And you can work with your board if you have a board or with uh, mentors or advisors, right? But the, we encourage our companies to put together these operating plans very early on so that they can be, be detached uh, of the emotion and go through these pivots a little bit more rationally. Now, I want to do one final question, then we're going to do a quick fire round. I want to ask about biggest miss. I think often we learn a lot from our biggest miss and how it changes our investing mindset. Um, <laughs> so when we think about our biggest miss today, what's the biggest miss and how did it impact your investment decision making? Mar loves this question. That's a very <laughs> painful question. 
I'll say it fast. <laughs> because, um, you know, I think we all have our anti-portfolio, which is the companies that we could have invested and we did not invest. Mm -hmm. In the life of Pear, we're nine years old. We've done 14 big misses. So there's not just one. So I think it's one and a half per which year. One's, which one sticks with you the most? Um, you know, I think probably Rappi is the one that pains me the most. Um, why, why Rappi in particular? Uh, they were from Spain, which is where I'm from. We actually worked really hard. We introduced them to their first investors. And, um, you know, ultimately we didn't do it because the valuation at the time, this was 2016, it was 26 million. And Peshman and I thought, oh my God, that is crazy. Who would do a seat at 26 million, right? Um, and at the end, you know, our business is very simple. You have to back the best people, big markets. Um, when you start thinking about valuation or analyzing proof points, et cetera, you know, you make mistakes. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know, that was our biggest, but I have 14, you know, so. <laughs> I mean, that's a cool episode. So we, lots we, of scars. 14 scars, <laughs> yes. Okay, we're going to do a quick fire round. Ready? All right. But, I, but I'm going to direct the questions here, so don't worry. So we're going to go with Pepe. What is the most common investment mistake you see now? Not building your own criteria and being dragged by FOMO. I, I heard a brilliant one, which is, you know, uh, ventures traditionally FOMO, but in 2022, we have JOMO, which is <laughs> joy of missing out. Yes. Um, uh, tell me, Mark, what's the best investment advice you've received? Um, we're not on the bus in the business of not investing, which means that when you look at a company, it's not about why it won't work, but what could happen that it would work. You know, that's the way to look at it. Pepe, why Europe? Why now? You're obviously in Barcelona. Uh, why Europe? Why now for Pair? Well, we're in Europe. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I, think, I think talent is more fluid than ever. And great talent comes from or wants to live in Europe now. Ma, biggest fundraising mistake you see founders make today? Uh, go see Sequoia for your first meeting. So please practice first like a hundred times before you see anybody you want. <laughs> Do you say they should? Sorry. Do you say they should stage, stage it in terms of like angels first, test out? No, I mean like you're ready to go find it. You know, when you practice a pit, you're you're getting ready. It's like a little bit of acting, right? Um, if you want to see your highest target, your you want I want to work with this investor. Don't go pitch him first. Practice with other people before you go see your, you know, your best practice, target. Practice with the other investors. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Pepe, what have you recently changed your mind on? Uh, that's a good one. I thought we would become kind of Zoom animals, and <laughs> I am valuing more and more the in-person meetings. Yep, got you. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, what would you most like to change about the world of venture? Well, one, uh, one of the things I care a lot about is diversity. You know, we still have, um, it's a, you know, and I think it's less in Europe, but in the U.S., we still have only 2% of companies that are female founders only, and 15% have one female. So, you know, that's, that's something we can do better as a... Okay, so final one for both of you, and I want like, separate ones from each of you. So what was your most recent publicly announced investment, and why did you say yes and get so excited? Too. I'll start. So um, there's a company that I'm very excited about. They're actually from Barcelona. It's called Spathios. It's a platform to book uh, venues for corporate events. And I met the founder through actually a common contact, a common founder. And um, I've been in the business of organizing e events. I know how painful it is to book a venue, to book everything that needs to happen. And we love the greed of the founder. So uh, we decided to invest in their pre-seed and they've been part of of Perex, which is our uh, pre-seed bootcamp, and uh, we're very excited, very excited. They're going to be doing a, a seed soon. Ma, most recent investment? Uh, you know, now people announce their seeds like a year later, so you know, <laughs> I have to rewind. Um, but uh, maybe Fair Street, which is a company that sells software to Medicare agents, it sounds really boring, but it's a massive market. Um, the founders, Tori and Sarah, took my class at Stanford, and they came in with the idea of building a healthcare company. I said no for two years, uh, and they kept working on it and iterating. So finally, I'm like, oh my God, this, people are never going to give up. So, you know, we ended up backing them and um, we helped them through the pre-seed. And 
they just cl they just a few months ago they closed the seed round with was several times oversubscribed so they're really happy about it i'm going to ask one more really unfair one ma in 10 years time where is pear in 10 years time you know our vision is very clear for pear we want to be the best seed fund that ever existed so i you know it's um i think when you look at a series, you know, the, the, the great firms, the Series A firms, you know which are the top five, but, you know, how about Seed? And that's where Payer wants to be. So, you know, we had a lot of work to do. Ma, we're Pepe, on it. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been a joy to do. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.